everyone. This is the session for uh, Fast Speech for Energy Storage. Uh, we have a great cast here of uh, program director Halid Chisman, Peter DeBock, RPI fellow Julia uh, Greenwald, and Jack Lunard. Um, here, if you have any questions during the fast speeches, please scan this QR code and ask your question. They will be processed and send us to the, sent to the podium. And we will answer them after everybody has presented their fast speech. And first, we're going to start with Jack, who is going to present an energy storage challenge for you. <laughs> well, thanks, Lorraine, for the introduction. And, uh, and uh, I'd like to you know, thank the audience for coming in. Uh, we're going to be talking about storage. I realize it's right after lunch, maybe not such a dynamic topic. I want to acknowledge that. But I just want to ask you guys, uh, has anybody ever run out of gas? And uh, you, you don't have to raise your hand. And have you ever done it with your spouse or significant other? And have you ever been reminded about that time you ran out of gas? And so this is the context around storage, because here's the issue for us. Um, in, our, in our presentation, we're going to talk about storage in the low carbon future. And uh, the low carbon future assumes we're getting rid of fossil energy. And it turns out that's where we actually have most of our storage. Um, so if I could get the first slide. Um, so let me just say a few words. You know, in, in the US economy, we use about 100 quads of energy a year. And 80 of those quads are fossil energy. And we store, to keep an insurance policy, we store about 14 quads of energy. It's two months of storage. So it's kind of like you know walking around with two months of salary just in case. Most of us don't have such a fat wallet, but that's what we do. And the reason we do it is because we've learned that we need it. We don't do this by accident. We do it because we actually need it. And it's how we maintain the reliability of our system. The, um, the, the question is, as we get rid of fossil fuels, what are we going to do to replace this? Because we have all this fuel that we can use with fast access, and we're willing to pay for it, and now it's going away. So let's just say a few words about the energy that we do store. It's all fuel. It's solids. It's coal. It's, uh, it's oil and gas liquids. It's natural gas and propane. And again, we have about two months of this stuff in storage all the time. And we can access it very quickly, usually within a day, anywhere in the United States within probably four days. Well, this is all fuel that we're storing, too. And it's all very convenient. But now when we look ahead, we're going on our low carbon diet. And that's all good. That's all good, right? We've got to get rid of carbon. But you know, <laughs> when we decrease our fossil fuel by 50 to 100%, we also, as a result, lose 7 to 14 ecajoules of energy storage. And what are we going to do to replace it? Remember, we have this stuff because we need it, or at least we perceive we do. So the questions are, and there's several of these, how much do we really need? What are we going to store? Remember, we store fuel now. And where are we going to put all this stuff? So let me postulate an option here. Let's say we only get rid of 50% of our fossil fuels, and we're going to store the other seven ecajoules as electricity. Hmm. Seems like a good idea, all electric future, a lot of renewable energy coming online. But we have a problem, we have a battery gap. And the battery gap is that today, of that seven ecajoules, we have 0, 0.00 nothing of lithium batteries for grid storage. And we need 14 billion tons more or less of lithium, which is a problem because we don't have anywhere near the capacity to produce that. So we got kind of a, we kind of got a gap there. But we have a second gap, we have a site gap. 14 billion tons of stuff is a lot of stuff to hide. So we said, OK, we're going to just distribute amongst all the people in the United States. We wind up with about 2 thirds of a blue whale of batteries in the backyard of every home in the US. So clearly, we got some problems around this solution. So let's imagine a different solution. Let's look to nature. And what does nature say? Ha, huh, you use fat. Now, <clears throat> some of us appreciate that, but fat is chemical bonds, not electrochemical bonds. And so you can get energy densities that are 10 to 100 times higher. And it's also a lot more efficient from, from a lot of thermodynamic standpoints. The key when you use fats for storage 
is you want to work on oxidizing the carbon-hydrogen bond. You do not want to break the carbon-carbon bonds, because if you do, you're going to make CO2, and you're going to have all the same problems that we have today. And if we're really tricky, maybe we can repurpose some of those assets that we already have. So how could this look? Well, here's a thought experiment. Let's take one of those oil tanks, and we're going to fill it up with oil, but I'm also going to throw in a little bit of alcohol just to make it interesting. And what we're going to do is when we need electricity, we're going to take oxygen, and we're going to react it with that oil, only the carbon-hydrogen bonds, and we're going to turn those carbon-hydrogen bonds into alcohols, and we're going to throw that back in our tank where it sinks to the bottom. That's when we want to make electricity. Later on, when we have more electricity than we need, we'll make hydrogen, and we'll essentially recharge the system by reacting the hydrogen with those alcohols and regenerating our oil. And if you look, we're taking two gases, we have a tank of oil, and we're generating electricity and recharging. We essentially have the equivalent of a battery. And these two gases, maybe we could use the gas storage that we already have for these two gases, as well as reuse those liquid storage tanks that we have. And all this fits really nicely just to make the story complete. In the future where we have electrolyzers, where we're making hydrogen and oxygen, all the pieces kind of fall together. It's a really interesting story. So if it's so easy, why is RPE talking about it? Well, eh, it turns out it actually is RPE hard. It's not as easy as I say. The first problem is we have no idea how much storage we need. Remember the title was, How Much Is Not Enough? And for anybody who ran out of gasoline with their significant other in the Chesapeake Bay Tunnel with their kids in the backseat of the minivan, how much is not enough is a very painful question. <laughs> the second thing is what to store. We just talked about storing electrons. Uh, kind of tough, right? But we also talked about storing liquids and gases that maybe could be turned into electrons. Maybe that's an approach. And remember, what we store today is fuel. So maybe we store zero carbon fuels. Who knows? That's why we're asking a lot of questions here. Where do we put this stuff for fast access? Because we got to be able to get it quickly, right? So what about that thought experiment that I put out there? Hey, really cool idea. A couple of holes in it. First of all, we don't have the chemistry to do that. Selective oxidation of these bonds, mm, not there. Hardware, it's all made up. It's just on the screen. It's a, it's a diagram. And can we actually repurpose existing storage? Who knows? Don't know. So what's next? You know, my job is to ask hard questions and to give out money for really smart people to answer them. So what I'd like to suggest is let's anticipate this problem. We know we are moving to a low-carbon future. That's, that's a done deal. We're going to lose that hydrocarbon storage. And if we have learned to be addicted to 14 ecojoules of storage, and we believe that we need that, maybe we need to think hard about what we're going to do. Let's get creative. We saw one solution that was kind of a solution, maybe not a solution. I think we, we can all agree that you know doing everything in batteries may be tough. Hey, Hallie's going to ask you, he's going to challenge you to think outside the box. I'm joining him. We need, we need some out-of-the-box thinking here. And finally, we've got a trillion dollars of hydrocarbon infrastructure. We have storage all across the country. We have pipes, railroads, roads to connect it. All this stuff is there. Maybe we can reuse some of that to minimize our impacts. So let me finish by saying, huh, you know, again, my job is to give out money, not to solve problems. So I would like to challenge you in the room to think about what you can do to contribute to the problem. We're going to need a lot of expertise. So I'm asking the questions, but I'm looking for answers. And hopefully you can find me here after the session at Coffee with RBE or send me a message. In the meantime, my colleague Peter will talk about energy storage that actually flies. So thank you for your attention. Look forward to your questions. Thank you, Jack. Iron Man has an arc reactor in his chest that makes him fly through the sky. But sustainable energy has many forms. We have solar, wind, hydrogen, fusion. Can we go from pumping fuel to loading sustainable energy? And for that, I'd like to introduce a concept called the aviation energy block. A standardized system that can be sustainable, energy dense, and safe. Energy is at the heart of aviation. Anytime an innovation in energy has occurred, aviation has evolved. We went from short flights to long flights to international flights and global flights. But there are three challenges that need to be solved simultaneously in aviation, which makes it a very interesting 
area. You need to bring the energy on board of the aircraft. You need to store it in a safe and energy dense way. And then you need to transform that energy into propulsion. Now we have two programs already on the propulsion side. We have reached an ascent that together form a pathway towards an electrified aviation platform that is about twice as efficient. But on the getting the energy on board and on the storage side, we still have a lot of problems to solve, and especially if you look at diverse sustainable energy. Now you might think, why don't we just do it like an electric vehicle? Stick in a battery pack and a charge cable, and maybe that'll work. And I'd like to illustrate to you some of the challenges that that will hold. On this slide, you will see in the top left corner a small pictogram of a battery. Imagine that battery being a 100 kilowatt hour battery as you might find on a Tesla P100D, one of the largest battery packs in, in cars. It's a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack. And with a state of the art charger, you could charge such a battery pack with a 250 kilowatt supercharger in about 24 minutes, which is quite an impressive achievement. But what does this look like for aviation? And, and Boeing 737 has 7,000 gallons of jet fuel on board. And 7,000 gallons of jet fuel, the chemical energy equivalent in battery language, would be 2,500 times that 100 kilowatt hour huge battery pack. That is immense. And it's hard to visualize something that's 2,500 times larger than, than, than the baseline. But I tried to do that anyways. It fills the entire screen. And this is for a 737. You go to a wide body, it's about four times more than that. So in order to charge that, that 737, you would need 2,500 cables, superchargers, at each 250 kilowatts for a total energy transfer of 630 megawatts. Now, it happens to be that an aircraft turns around at the gate in about 30 minutes. So doing that with a 24-minute charger would be appropriate. But I think it would take me longer than 24 minutes to put in 2,500 charge cables. So how can we get sustainable energy on board of these kind of platforms. And this is where the concept of the aviation energy block comes in. Can we get to a standardized system where we can develop the energy side and the aviation side agnostic of each other? Such a system would need to be safe, swappable. It would be great if you could actually charge the energy blocks on the ground while an airplane is in flight and then at the gate swap the full with the empty blocks. Intermodal, can we use such a system on trains, um, trucks, ships, but all have the same standard dimensions. And my vision here is to really have a, a box with just electrical terminals on the outside, plus or minus electrode, giving a specified voltage that any system could use. You might say that's a nice dream, but we are familiar with such a system every day. It's called batteries. When we're looking at a TV remote, or perhaps the remote of this clicker, they're all using the same form factor of batteries. When somebody designs a TV remote, they don't care whether that battery has alkaline, lithium, rechargeable, whatever chemistry, because it's a standardized form factor and a standardized output. And that means that both the system and the energy source were developed independently of each other. Now, an aviation energy block might be much bigger and if you think about that, maybe it's the size of a cargo container or something much larger, because you would need to store a lot more energy. Inside of that, you could still have a battery chemistry, or maybe a hydrogen system, or even a sustainable fuel genset. But the important thing about a concept like aviation energy block is that it has to be a system. All the health management, controls, safety, everything has to be on the inside. Because on the outside, the only thing you want to see is a plus or minus terminal. Maybe a control wire for help management, but that's about it. Now, I'm going to go a little bit deeper in one of these areas, let's say the hydrogen block, to show you what I really mean with that. When you design an aircraft, you really focus on range. How do you get the most range? How do you carry the most payload? And the Breguet equation, which determines range, is really driven by two main factors. It's the energy per mass, or specific energy, and the propulsion efficiency. And if you look at sustainable fuels, some of them actually have specific energy that's much higher than jet fuel, which makes them quite interesting. You can see here on this bar chart, in gray, this, you know, the potential for specific energy of these fuels. 
and in blue what can be realized today. So you can see that hydrogen has a significant advantage in its, its specific energy compared to jet fuel. But the challenge is if you in include the storage density efficiency and the propulsion efficiency, that potential gets re reduced to only a fraction. And it could be an RPE uh, opportunity to realize more of that potential and maybe go to 50% or 80%, which I think will definitely be RPE hard. The second part of that challenge is, how do you store these kind of new fuels onto an aircraft in a dense, dense way? So these are the trade-offs that you'd have to do. Will you make the future hydrogen energy block, will you focus on the, fuel, on the fuel tank or will you focus on the fuel cell? Or do you focus on the safety system to make all of this work? If I want to fly my children on that plane, it has to be as safe or safer than the technologies that we have today. The second part is, what are the dimensions that would be needed for such an energy block? Uh, currently, we store a lot of fuel and energy in our wings and also part of the, the, the fuselage. Would the future energy block be a small modular unit that you can stick in the wings of an aircraft? Or would it be more like this LD3 cargo container that you can stick into the hull of an aircraft? If you make it too big, there's too, little, too few platforms that could actually use it. If you make it too small, the energy efficiency might be compromised. So this would be very interesting to know what are the kind of common dimensions for a future, I don't know, aviation battery factor that we need. And it might be that we have several categories, a small one, a medium one, and a large one. So I want to go from pumping fuel to loading sustainable energy. Join me on this journey. Give us feedback on this concept. Identify, help me identify what the transformational technologies are and what form factors do you think would be most suitable for such a, for such a technology. As Iron Man soars to the sky with its glowing arc reactor, help me make the future of aviation sustainable. My name is Peter de Bach. my information is here, but also see me at Coffee with RPE tomorrow. Now my colleague Halley will talk about some electrochemical solutions that can be cooked up to make some of these things happen. Thank you. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn, and cauldron bubble. Thank you for the introduction, Peter, and good afternoon to you all. Please come join me as we explore the world of glorious gulp, goop, and glow. Last year we asked a question, what if we could have batteries five times better than we have today in terms of their energy content? We saw that that would enable us to electrify everything up to 100-seater regional aircraft. We also saw it could be useful for other applications. We postulated that we might think about metals as fuels. Lithium is very close to jet fuel in terms of its energy content. And even in their oxidized forms, we have a lot of energy above our notional battery 1K target. Well, I want to thank you because following last year's summit, lots of people came to talk to us. Lots of people came to talk to us about how this might be useful for planes, trains, and maritime. We also had people come to talk to us about possible solutions. And we were able to sort of capture those solutions into three strategies. Goop, or electroactive fuels. A gulp, utilizing available resources and glow, breaking the taboos of temperature. Now we need to look at a little bit closer at some of the applications. This is the freight network for the USA. We would be lost without the freight that gets delivered to us. Trains, planes, ships, and even um, um, planes, which uh, we wouldn't be here probably without uh, as far as today is concerned. Passenger EVs are wimpy, or as I would say, namby-pamby. They have an easy life. They spend 95% of the time in the garage or parked on the street. These vehicles and vessels are workhorses. They're expected to work over 16 hours a day and last 20 or 30 years. So as we look, think about energy storage solutions for these applications, we have to be very mindful of how they're going to be used and what is expected of them. Um, some definitions for you. You're all familiar with electrically recharging things, cell phones, EVs. We launched a great program this year called EVs for All related to that. 
The bottom picture is a ferry that takes 26 separate charging ports. And as Peter said, as the energy increases, you end up with ridiculous numbers of connections. In the industry, there's something that we call mechanically rechargeable. This is where we have anodes as cartridges that can be put into the vessel or vehicle. And you can see here an electric bus that work with zinc cartridges in a zinc air um, electrochemical system. Open water power, now part of L3 Harris, aluminum seawater battery. And on the right-hand side, just to include some fuel cell stuff, we can consider taking solids that contain hydrogen, like hydrides, and we can use them in the same cartridge format. Sometimes I think I've been in batteries for too long, and uh, um, energy storage, electrochemical, has, has been my life. And as I've been on this journey this last 10 months, I've had to unthink what I thought I knew about electrochemical energy storage. Things aren't always about putting them in packages or shapes or within certain dimensions. Constraints such as temperature and availability of resources have to be rethought. So I've done this in my brain. If you go to my brain, you'd see these three pictures with big X's over them, right? As I've tried to uh, rethink what we can do in this category. So let's start with goop, right? Here is some goop. You will be familiar, I think, with flow batteries. These involve solutions of catalytes and analytes fed into fuel cells to create the uh, electrical energy. Those solutions are low energy density, maybe not more than 100 watt hours per kilogram. What if we could have electroactive pumpable slurries, high energy charge gels and goops, take nano solids and suspend them in low viscosity fluids? Well, you can see here, here's an example, a company called Influid Energy. You can see the catalyte and the analyte, which are now slurries of high concentrated electroactive materials. Um, gulp. This is Michael Phelps. When he breathes in, he gulps in 10 litres of air per breath. That's about 10 times more than probably anybody else in this audience, right? Within that 10 litres of air is enough oxygen if combined with the right metal, to replace the battery in your cell phone. So that air is acting as a catalyte. It's accepting electrons, in this case, from lithium. Let's look at the metal side. Aluminum, a 14-gram aluminum can, has enough electron-giving capacity in it to run a MacBook Pro or MacBook Air for the life of the battery. Alternatively, we could actually use the aluminum to generate hydrogen and then feed that hydrogen maybe safer into a fuel cell system. Um, irony is one of those great things in our life, and one of the ironical things is to use enemies against themselves, right? CO2 is the enemy. We're breathing out a lot of it right now, and it's why we don't like fossil fuels. Well, we can turn the enemy against itself, and a company called Noon Energy is developing a carbon dioxide-based batteries. Probably not going to be suitable for uh, planes, but could well be suitable for other applications, including maritime. Um, we all know chemistry works better if you heat it up. Arrhenius can be our friend. Um, maybe uh, things like thermal runaway are different. Certainly planar electrode surfaces can work better than they would otherwise. And we should not scare to think about putting batteries in these vessels and vehicles which run at high temperatures. At the moment, we, we, we attach a jet engine which runs at 1,500 degrees C to those wings. We have solid oxide fuel cells. We have diesels. We have um, even grid energy storage batteries running to high temperatures. Are there transportation battery chemistries that if we ran them at high temperatures could give us the kind of energy densities that we're looking for? New word for the day, gantrify. This is not in the Oxford Dictionary, but I want it in the Oxford Dictionary. So write this word down and start tweeting it, right? <laughs> to combine mechanical structure with electrochemical function. We're starting to see that somewhat in automotive as they build batteries into the chassis of vehicles. We may see Peter's energy box on planes helping provide the energy for flight operations. How about solid state batteries within the wings for the reserve? A typical plane has 20, 30, 20 to 30% of its energy kept in reserve. 
And finally, and you can visit these guys on uh, booth 213. I didn't get paid for this commercial. Um, a company called Invent Wood, coming out of University of Maryland, Professor, Professor Lu, Hu's group, they developed a wood that's 20 times stronger than ordinary wood and 80% lighter than steel. The same group have found that you can open up nanocellulosic fibers with copper and then they produce these highways where lithium ions can run up and down them. So that group's developed a wood that's interesting and they found an electrical chemical function for the same nanocellulosic fibers. Wouldn't it be incredible if those two things came together to gantrify um, this as a possibility for aviation or other applications? And I should point out this doesn't stand on its own. This is the fourth strategy, but it can be applied to help the other three that we've already covered. So just to summarize, I don't think outside the box, think no box. Nanotechnology has been around for a while. We had to start getting this to work for us in terms of helping us to deliver new, exciting ideas that will solve, us prob solve the problems we're facing. Use air, carbon dioxide, seawater, use external resources to help the electrochemical energy density challenge. Get rid of the taboos of temperature, embrace electrochemical glow. And finally, new word of the day, not gentrify, gantrify energy storage. Combine mechanical structure with electrochemical function. So thank you for listening. Uh, meet me for coffee tomorrow, grab me during the summit, or send me an email. I want to hear from you as we pursue the next part of this journey. So that's me done. Um, putting the invasion of 1066 aside, it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome Laurent Pilot to the, to the stage. And he's going to be talking to us about batteries and the circular economy. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Hi, everyone. I'm Laurent Pilon, or Laurent Pilon. <clears throat> We've all noticed that there are more and more electric vehicles on the road today. Um, maybe you own one. Maybe you came with one this morning. We are witnessing what has been called the EV revolution. This revolution will bring better air quality to our city and will decarbonize the transportation sector, which accounts for 27% of all greenhouse gas emissions in this country today. However, 80% of EV batteries are made in China, and 80% of the recycling capacity is also in China. So the question I have for all of us is, how do we achieve a, a circular and domestic EV battery supply chain here in North America? First, let me clarify what I mean by circularity. If you take the linear supply chain that applies to a lot of products we use today, you take, you make, you use, you dispose. For an EV, uh, electric vehicle, you take the minerals, the energy you make, battery cells, you group the cells into modules, you group modules into a pack, you build the vehicle around the pack, and you give the vehicle to the dealership. The dealership sells the vehicle to users, and at some point, 5, 10, 15 years later, the vehicle, the battery, will die. And obviously, we don't want to dispose of it because it's flammable and it's toxic. So that's when we think about circularity. And we often equate circularity with recycling. But recycling is quite a long process. You take the battery at the end of life, disassemble it, shred the modules, and recover only the valuable minerals, like cobalt, nickel, copper, and sometimes lithium. And you put them back at the very beginning of the supply chain where to, to substitute for minerals you would otherwise have to mine. And so here I would like to suggest other ways, simpler ways, and more ways to achieve circularity than recycling. We could, sorry, we could service the, the battery at the dealership to prolong its life. We could reuse 
dispose some of the parts and reuse the others that are working. We could disassemble the entire pack and use different components and remanufacture a battery pack the same way we remanufacture an internal combustion engine today. And then we think of recycling as a process of last resort. And not only we manage the risk associated with the supply of critical minerals, but also we recover the manufacturing value that would be lost if we were to only recycle. Today, 3% of all vehicles on the road globally are electric. We're going to multiply that number by a factor 10 in the next 10 years in all major economies. We're going to achieve this by reducing the price of batteries. The price has come down tremendously already. That's why it's possible today. Today, a battery pack costs $150 per kilowatt hour. We're going to divide that price by a factor two by 2030. And we're going to achieve this by economies of scale, better manufacturing, but also by removing the amount of critical minerals like cobalt and nickel. This, is, this table shows different chemistries for battery and the amount of minerals that are contained in a 60 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack. What, traveling from left to right is a historical trend uh, with, where you see that the, the content of cobalt is decreasing. Last year, lithium iron phosphate, the last column, amount, accounted for 40% of all electric vehicle batteries. This battery chemistry does not contain any cobalt or nickel, yet these minerals are what pays for the recycling process today. So, who is going to recycle is the question. At what cost and who is going to pay? So the same way we can anticipate a wave of electric vehicles on our road, we can anticipate a, a wave of, of spent batteries. And my concern is that this wave of spent batteries will accumulate in a mountain of waste that is not worth much, which is toxic and dangerous. And then the EV revolution will have been a lost opportunity. So we need to get this right. And again, this idea of servicing, reuse, remanufacturing, in addition to recycling, and thinking, designing, selecting materials with the end of life in mind, and thinking of recycling as a process of last resort can guide us. So here are some examples of how we could get it right. For example, we can learn from lead-acid batteries, where you can service them and extend their life by adding chemicals, by doing pulse conditioning. Um, do you know of a battery material whose degradation mechanism can be reversed? Or do you know of a technique that could reverse the degradation of existing lithium-ion batteries? If so, I'd love to hear from you. When it comes to the battery modules, you take the cells and you weld them together into a module. When that module has reached its end of life, we shred it. Because they are all welded together, it's very hard to separate. And in the interest of time, we shred everything. But this module may be faulty because of one cell. The others, we could continue using them, but we don't. Do you know a technique, a joining technique, that could achieve excellent mechanical strength, excellent electrical conductivity, but be reversible so we can detach individual cells? Or do you know of a design of a cell that could be opened up so that we can separate anode and cathode so that we can avoid shredding the battery as the first step of the, of the recycling process? When we make battery packs, we use a lot of epoxy. This epoxy is very strong and very hard to detach. So we just destroy the, the pack when we disassemble it. Do you know of a debondable adhesive that could be reversibly attaching and providing very strong bonds, but 
could be removed easily and maybe even reused? Or are you thinking of battery pack modules or, or packs, sorry, that could be opened up easily, disassembled, you could replace individual components and you could pick up cells that are faulty. In fact, when you can do this, you would need a battery intelligence system that could tell us which cell to pick up because it's faulty or because it's going to fail between the current service and the next one. Preemptively, we could do this servicing. If you have any technologies, ideas along this line to, to accomplish these circularity concepts, I'd love to hear from you. My email address is here and I'll be at Coffee with Arpai tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. And I will pass the microphone to Julia Greenwald. Thank you. Thanks, Laurent. Today, I'm going to talk about a potential supply shortage associated with our clean energy future, helium. The first thing that comes to mind for most people when thinking about helium is balloons. Helium is used in everything from party balloons to weather balloons to spy balloons. More than 6 billion cubic feet of helium are produced annually, enough to fill more than 780 million balloons. What I hope to convince you of today is that helium is essential for a variety of energy-related industries, and we need new technologies to increase its supply. Helium is an extremely small and inert gas. It has the smallest atomic radius and lowest boiling point of any element on the periodic table. Because of these properties, it's used in a variety of energy-related industries. It's used in semiconductor manufacturing and fiber optics, welding, as a lifting gas and leak detector. And in its liquid form, it's used to cool superconducting magnets in applications ranging from fusion reactors to quantum computers. The single largest use of helium globally is cryogenic cooling of superconducting magnets, accounting for 32% or 2 billion cubic feet of annual demand. Other energy-related industries account for roughly 50% of annual helium demand. But as we look towards an increasingly smart and electrified future, our need for semiconductors and fiber optics will increase. Industries that rely on superconducting magnets are also anticipated to grow. But what if the growth of these industries is limited by our helium supply? This scenario is quite likely as we're currently experiencing a helium shortage. There have been four helium shortages in the last 20 years, and the issue has made headlines not only in scientific publications, but also in national and local news, and even caused research labs at prestigious universities to close. The research community is so concerned that they issued a report regarding the liquid helium crisis and the need for an action plan to preserve U.S. innovation. Historically, the U.S. was the largest producer of helium globally, accounting for more than 90% of global production in 1980. But by 2021, our share of global production had decreased to less than 50%. And this trend is expected to continue as other countries build out their helium infrastructure. But increases in foreign supplies will not necessarily be enough to meet rising demand, and shortages are likely to continue. In any shortage, there's three options for what to do. You can make more of what you need, find a replacement, or conserve. Finding a replacement is difficult because of the unique properties of helium. And conservation is a noble goal. There have been major advances in helium recycling and efficiency in the last 20 years. But ultimately, it won't be enough to meet rising demand. So our only option is to make more. But helium can't be synthesized like a chemical in the lab. It forms via radioactive decay within the Earth's crust. And this is a process that takes millions of years, effectively rendering helium non-renewable. And when helium escapes from the Earth's crust, it's light enough and inert enough that it can be released into space and lost forever. The helium that we do capture is produced as a byproduct of natural gas. But this is limited to a small number of gas fields globally, because the concentration of the helium in the gas stream is extremely small, typically less than 1%. The state of the art for separating such a small concentration of helium from natural gas is liquefaction. So 
our mixed gas stream is cooled to the point that the natural gas or methane condenses into a liquid, and helium is left above in the vapor. At this point, helium is worth 10 times more than methane, but we don't do this at a wide number of facilities because it costs more than a billion dollars to build a liquid natural gas plant. What's more, this infrastructure means that helium production is tied to natural gas. And as Jack mentioned, we're going to need to decrease our production of natural gas to hit net zero by 2050. So when we go on our low-carb diet, how will we decouple helium production from natural gas production? Well, recently, a hydrocarbon-free helium source was found near a volcano in Tanzania. What's important is that the gas seep was nitrogen-rich and contained more than 10% helium, suggesting that we could have primary helium production without natural gas. In the United States, this map shows all of the natural gas wells we have, and highlighted in orange are those with a helium content of more than 0.3% which is the minimum concentration required to economically recover helium with existing technology. But in certain areas, like northwest New Mexico, we found higher concentrations of helium associated with high concentrations of nitrogen. Recently, a paper produced a model suggesting an explanation for why helium and nitrogen are often found in close proximity and how we could directly prospect for helium. Looking at the Williston Basin in the northern United States, they suggested that there may be helium concentrations as high as 6%. But still, to leverage this resource, we're going to need new infrastructure and separation techniques. One possible solution is membranes. Membranes have the ability to separate things with less energy intensity and let us move away from cryogenic processes that are very energy intensive. But up to this point, I've been mainly discussing helium-4. Helium-3 is an isotope of helium that is attractive as a fuel source for fusion. It has an even lower boiling point than helium-4, but it's not typically used for cryogenic cooling. This is because it's incredibly rare. It's a million times less abundant than helium-4. This is reflected in the price and the fact that we measure it in thousands of liters rather than billions of cubic feet. It's so rare that many people have suggested we should mine it on the moon because we can't find it here on Earth. But what I hope I've convinced you of today is that we need new technologies to increase our supply of helium. These might be new mapping and sensing techniques to identify terrestrial resources, lunar mining, reprocessing of nuclear waste to leverage that radioactive decay process, or new membranes and ways of thinking about separating helium-3 from helium-4 to maximize our supply. I'd love to hear from you if you have ideas in these areas. I'll be at coffee with ARPA-E tomorrow, or you can email me at the address shown. Thank you. OK. So I hope we can put the QR code again on the screen for you to ask any questions. Um, OK, while this comes, the QR code comes, think about the question you're going to text us. Um, here is the first question for Jack from the audience. What is the cost per unit energy stored for the current method of storing with fuel, fossil fuel? Oh, so it's really cheap to store fossil fuels. Um, <clears throat> a coal pile is basically the inventory carrying cost. You know, <laughs> you pay for the coal. And, and so it's, it's the financial cost associated with that because the pile itself, there's very little that's done. In the case of propane, you can store propane for about 25 cents a gallon. That's what it costs you in the salt domes like up in Michigan. And, and the, the, the propane industry pays for that because people will hedge. Essentially, you can pre-buy your propane to lock in a price. In the case of natural gas, it's maybe on the order of 10 cents a million BTU. It depends on, on the storage basin. So, and, and, and the cost to store oil is, is incredibly cheap. Again, it's really just the inventory carrying cost. So you've got an entire fossil infrastructure that's built around very, very low cost storage. And in contrast, when you move to batteries, the capex is enormous. And of course, when you store fossil fuels, I'll call it the return efficiency, the round trip efficiency is essentially 
it's 100%. You put the coal in the pile, you take it out. When you store electrons, it's, it's going to be lower. So higher capex, higher losses. So a follow-up on that question is, can this give a target cost metric for next generation batteries? Well, so <laughs> well, I'd flip that question around. I would say our economy has a price point for storing energy. There's an entire business of energy arbitrage out there. And that energy arbitrage is set around competing uses and people basically voting themselves off the grid, if you will, or not using that energy. So I think the challenge is we're going to have to find this new equilibrium point, recognizing that the cost of storage is going to be significantly higher than what we've traditionally paid. And that raises a question of reliability, redundancy, and ability of people to essentially not use energy as an alternative to paying a very high price. It's a whole new equilibrium we have to establish. That's what I would suggest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, questions for Hali and Peter, and note that they may not have the same answer. Alpai is not a consensus organization. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> but for both of you, Hali and Peter, how viable are the proposed battery concepts for naval vessels? For naval vessels? Yes. Well, I think at the moment we're still exploring a very broad space. So some of them are going to be very viable, I believe. Um, others less so, and uh, you know it all comes down to the particular needs of any particular vessel or vehicle, and which solution will be best. You know, I mentioned the CO two battery; that's going to be maybe good for some applications and not others. You know, a high density, a high power, um, metal fueled battery <laughs> is going to be good for some applications and not others. Depends; it's going to be depend very much on the specific needs of the application. And I think to some extent, and, uh, a propulsion drivetrain can be relatively agnostic until you get to the last part. Is are you going to use a propeller? Or are you going to use wheels? Or are you going to use a uh, turbine? So I think the, the energy storage part of that and converting that into shaft power, or converting it into some, some way of movement, can be relatively agnostic. I personally like the aerospace uh, environment because it's, it, it forces you to solve the hardest problem first. It's my vision that if you'd solve this propulsion challenge for aviation, it will immediately go through all the other applications. It also is a nice confined platform where you have to work on space, safety, and all of it in the most extreme way. Uh, the, the other mechanism that's important there is that in aerospace, uh, weight is a premium. So you can actually work on an application that will, that will value that much more where you look at, for instance, Navy where, where, or shipping where, where space is not as much a constraint. So you might up with a bigger unit with a lower density. So I think in general, the propulsion drivetrain technologies are agnostic, but are separate variants the closer you get to the propulsion side. Yeah, thank you. Um, again, please uh, feel free to send us your question through this uh, QR code. Uh, one question for J Julia. What is the main usage for e uh, helium-3? And why is it important? I think the principal use today of helium-3 is for neutron detection. And there's a lot of applications in homeland security. But uh, from an energy perspective, it's really attractive as a fuel for fusion because it doesn't produce high energy neutrons when it's reacted with uh, the deuterium plus helium-3 reaction. OK, thank you. Peter, one question for you. What are the system level integration and control challenges for practical use of the energy blocks? Well, the, the nice thing, I want all those challenges to be contained within the block. Uh, nowadays, I get questions, can you fund me a fuel tank? Can you fund the fuel cell? And I say, well, I want all the challenges to be on the table, even the safety challenges and the integration and health challenges. When you combine all of those into a system, then you really see how these, these elements stack up. If, I, if you would work on technologies piecemeal, then you still need to figure out how do they end up and will they in the end work into, into a viable system. If you can make them in modular systems that have to solve all the problems, it actually would provide a great comparison. And you might find that in shipping, uh, an energy block of some version will work better than in, in aerospace where you really a volume constraint. Um, so I think there are many uh, challenges, but I think they need to be part of the things that need to be investigated. Often we focus on a micro component, but the system integration challenges 
uh, are just as important. Mm -hmm. One question for Jack. If we are moving away from fossil fuels, why do we need any energy storage? Ah, well, the short answer is the cost of energy is pretty small. Gasoline, $3 a gallon. Gasoline, when you run out in the middle of Nevada on a winter day, yeah, you'd probably pay $1,000 a gallon, right? Mm. So there's an arbitrage around energy. The price of energy is low. The price of no energy is high, extremely high. It could be 10 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity, a million dollars a second for no electricity. And so it's that arbitrage of not having the energy when you need it that establishes the need in the marketplace. And the market has responded. Everything from the government with a strategic petroleum reserve to I can pre-buy my propane to companies hedging on the future of, of, of energy prices. And that's what creates the storage energy, the storage industry today. I don't think that's going to change when we have renewable power. It's not going to change when we get rid of fossil fuel. People will always want the insurance policy of knowing they've got something in their back pocket just in case. Remember, that 14 quads, 14 ecojoules, all of that was put in place because at some point in time, somebody ran out of energy. Thank you. Hali, <coughs> a question for you. If there are transformational technologies for plane, ship, and trains, how many years might it take mm. to develop them to be seen in real vehicles? Well, the, the flippant answer is, if we don't start now, we'll never see it, right? I think uh, we heard this morning, you know, um, <coughs> how things have changed the last 10, 20 years, and we're seeing things today that we couldn't have imagined. So I think it's going to take a while to develop solutions for these applications. And I would hope that we're into serious demonstrations uh, in the 2030s, and that if there is any opportunity for commercialization, we're commercializing in the 2040s so we can hit that 2050 net zero target. If you look at history, right, we want to be faster than history. If we're twice as fast as history, uh, then we'll meet the 2050 goal. Okay, thank you. Uh, one question for me is, how could battery as a service business models contribute to uptake of manu remanufacturing? So this is actually a very interesting question about battery as a service. This is actually a very popular business model in Asia where you have swappable battery and swappable station where you drive in and they replace your battery. Uh, not because you want to uh, a charge a quick charge, but sometimes you, you want to upgrade your battery because there's new material, longer range, for example. This is not a model um, that is too popular here in the US, um, but it would definitely help with circularity because you have a chance to see the battery more often. You could service it, you could remanufacture it, um, and uh, you could even upgrade it. So I think from a consumer point of view, this, is, this would be quite advantageous, um, and we should definitely explore it. I don't know that there is any technology challenges there. It, it exists. It's being done. Uh, Taiwan is very much ahead, and China and, and India is also following that model. So good question. Thank you. Um, Peter. Would an aviation energy block be safe? And how would it be certified by aviation authorities like the FAA? Uh, so that's a very good question. Um, safety can be engineered. If you look at an aircraft, uh, it can be a three to six million parts for a, for a wide body aircraft. And an aircraft is safe. Uh, you can fly on an aircraft that's guaranteed by the FAA to have a one in a billion failure. Um, so there are levels of redundancy, sensors, uh, and, and detection systems that make systems safe. So in my mind, an energy block can be engineered for safety. It does mean that there's going to be extra weight. Maybe you need some redundancy, maybe you need some extra safety systems, but that needs to be taken into account when we look at these new technologies. And maybe some innovation needs to occur on those elements. Now, currently we certify aircraft either at the propeller at the engine or at the aircraft level. So there might have to be a fourth category, which would be the energy, aviation energy block level, 
Uh, that might take some time, but I think we have some time to, to think about that. So in my mind, um, you know, when you look at even cars and, and aviation, many systems can be engineered for, for very high levels of safety, and I think in aviation, energy block uh, can be so also. Thank you. For Julia, <coughs> what about MRIs? Isn't that a big consumer of helium? Yeah, it's the largest consumer of helium-4. But there's been a lot of progress in making MRI machines much more efficient and using less helium over the last several decades. And I think newer technologies still have um, room to catch up in terms of achieving that efficiency. And we will still need lots of helium for future technologies and you know, research for technologies that we haven't even invented yet. Thank you. Um, again, we have a few more minutes if you want to ask a question. Um, Jack, what if we used vehicles to grid technology to increase the amount of storage available to the electric grid? Ah, I love the idea of vehicle to grid technology, you know, this two way technology. It's been, the concept's been around. But you have to recognize the limitations. So, 250 million vehicles with 10 gallons of gasoline in the tank. If that was all replaced with batteries, it is 0 0.3 ecajoules. 0 0.3. <laughs> if you look, okay, now we're gonna expand our horizon, we're gonna say all the gasoline in all of the gas stations, 110,000 gas stations in the United States, we get to maybe one ecajoule. So, we're used to 14, if you buy insurance, would you be willing to take a 95% cut on your insurance policy to feel good about that? That's the question at hand. So yes, vehicle to grid, let's absolutely do it, but it is not a panacea. It's orders of magnitude off of what we need. Thank you. Um, Hallie, lithium ion has had a number of well-publicized safety events. How do you ensure that any new technology especially high energy technologies can avoid such safety problems. Yeah, lithium ion's been around now for 31 years and it's had what one might call a colorful history. Um, you know, I think as we um, develop any new technology, we have to get ahead of the game. And I know that's easy to say, but we have to put the programs in place that actually say what we mean, or mean what we say. Uh, we did the EVs full program, which I briefly mentioned. We bolted into that program um, money for teams to actually develop the safety protocols that would be needed for advanced chemistries. And we wanted to do that up front rather than get down the road when we would be in commercialization and be um, living by the seat of our pants. And as we develop new technologies, we have to do that more and more. We have to get ahead, not only in developing safety tests, but in, in the regulations and the safety groups who are going to... Uh, um, introduce those tests and ultimately enforce the regulations. Okay, thank you. Um, let's finish by with Peter. Uh, would a centralized energy system, let's say hydrogen with fuel cell, not be more efficient than multiple aviation energy blocks? Yeah, it's a very good question. So if you have a bespoke system that's designed for a certain aircraft and it will only work on that, you could probably make it a little bit more efficient. But some of these technologies are modular. We talked earlier this morning about bankable technologies. You want to be something investable. And modular technologies have to be the part of the future because they're going to be growing at an investment scale that is much more feasible. If you look at a custom hydrogen solution for an aircraft and an aircraft that has to be designed at the same time, you're looking at a multi-billion dollar investment for a technology that's unproven. It's very difficult to do. Aviation energy block could potentially decouple that, where the energy blocks in the aircraft are, are designed separately, agnostic from each other, just like the remote for ETV and the batteries. Um, it's an advanced concept, but I think this is maybe some, some way to uncouple that stranglehold between the energy technology and the platform needs. Thank you. This ends our session of Fast Pitches. There's going to be another one later this afternoon if you check your program, if you like this format. There's going to be more of this uh, in the coming days. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for your questions. Thank you.